Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I am Madan Muswati um, from the Research and Software Engineering Group. And it's my pleasure to introduce Sus, uh, Susmit Sarkar today. He's a research fellow at University of University of Cambridge, and um, he is interested in you know mathematically characterizing, rigorously characterizing you know different aspects of our real world. And he's been thinking about the C plus uh, about the mem about the shared memory memory models uh, for quite some time now, and he's going to talk about the. You know both the hardware memory models of Power and ARM, and how they d led to the design of this the recent C C++ memory model. Yeah, Susmit. Thanks, Madan. And hello again. Uh, so as Madan said, I've been interested for the past several years in looking at shared memory concurrency and seeing what is going on there. So shared memory concurrency, it's great. We have been thinking about it for a long time. We have been writing concurrent algorithms, reasoning about these algorithms for a long time. Unfortunately, most of this work that we have been doing, we have started making this assumption that the way to think about it is you have a single shared memory and all threads have at all times a consistent view of this memory. So this is technically called sequential consistency and it leads to the nice property that you can reason about your programs by reasoning about all interleavings of all threads. Of course, as many of you well know, if you're programming on modern multiprocessors or even on modern compilers, this is just not true. What you get instead is something different. You get something called relaxed memory models. And these relaxed memory models are, well, they are stranger than sequential consistency, but they're also very different depending on the platforms you run on. So, of course, programming languages that we design, they have to deal with relaxed memory as well. And very recently, just late last year, in fact, C and C++ has, for the first time, concurrency as a first class defined part of the language in the language standards. This language standards was basically a lot of clever people trying to think of axioms about what concurrency should be. And I had a problem because they were going to implement it on real hardware, right? On x86, on ARM, on power. And the problem is, all these different hardware models, they are, well, different from the one that C and C++ has, but also very different from each other. So you get different flavors of relaxed memory, depending on where you are running on. So there is a real question, and this was a question in the concurrency committee's mind as well. Can we even implement this model that we have come up with on modern hardware? What would it take to answer that question? So first of all, what you would have to do is to map the constructs that C and C++ now have down to the machine level, into assembly code or something like that. Furthermore, your compiler has to understand this now. So it has to understand which optimizations are still legal to be doing, and perhaps which optimizations are now good to be doing, things like fence elimination or fence insertion. So in this talk, I'll focus on this question, but only on a part of this question. I'll focus on a particular variety of modern hardware, the power, which is very similar to ARM. So you can, in many places, think of what I'm saying as applying equally well to ARM. And furthermore, I'll just talk about mapping the constructs to assembly. I'll be happy to talk about optimizations with you if you want. But in this talk, I'll just be talking about the mapping. As you will see, even in this restricted problem space, there's quite a number of challenges to go on. So what do I mean by this mapping? So in Trying to explain that, I'll also explain a bit of what C and C++ now have for those of you who are not familiar. So first of all, that's just the normal kinds of stores and loads that you are used to writing in your programs. These are going to be mapped, as you might imagine, to assembly language stores and loads. Nothing very special going on here. Next, C and C++. By the way, I'll use those terms interchangeably here. For the purposes of the concurrency model, that's just the same. C and C++ then have different kinds of what are called atomic stores and loads. And they come in a variety of flavors. They are called sequentially consistent, relaxed, release, whatnot. 
and these are mapped now to well first of all just the underlying stores and loads but also this you'll notice stuff around there's various kinds of barriers that for example power gives you there's a compare and branch there's all kinds of stuff next programmers want to impose order when they want to by using fences or barriers and again c and c++ gives you various different flavors of fences these are mapped to various kinds of barriers as well finally there's slightly high level constructs that c11 also gives you things like compare and swaps and these are mapped to a rather longer but still not too long sequence of assembly there's special instructions logs and stocks which i will talk about there's complicated loops going on maybe there's barriers somewhere that kind of stuff so that's a mapping is that mapping correct in other words does it give you the semantics that c11 says it will and it turns out that the mapping i gave you was not it was not because well in one particular place you needed a different kind of barrier so okay is that mapping correct and not to leave you in suspense this time the answer is yes this one does preserve the semantics but then as a compiler writer you might think of asking well is that the only correct mapping can we do something else and then the answer as it turns out is no you could have alternative mappings where for example you put barriers on different places you make some operations less expensive and thereby make some other operations more expensive so you would think that compilers are free to choose whichever mapping they want but in fact if they want their code to be interoperable then at least at the boundaries they must agree on the mapping they are doing otherwise the bar barriers will just be in the wrong places so here we are i have given you three different mappings one which i said was wrong and two which i said were correct why should you have any confidence in me the only way to answer this kind of question is to turn to formal methods and we have proved this theorem that says that for any sane compiler that you can think of that matches that mapping that i had you take any c program at all then the comp compilation of this program has no more behavior in power than it would have in the c11 concurrency model so this is the standard kind of compiler soundness proof so in doing this proof it was easy to show that one version of the mapping the one i showed you which was proposed by various people before was in fact incorrect and various other mappings that people proposed were correct and equally good so are you going to define what means for compiler to be sane i will indeed and non optimizing mean it doesn't do any optimizing uh so briefly what it means is uh, it doesn't move around your stores and loads but i'll talk about that in detail as well okay so so that's a the theorem we proved and proving theorems is good we like doing that but also has good real world implications in this kind of theorem so first of all it builds confidence in the c and c++ models because as i said this was just a model invented by people so you built confidence in it by thinking about the intuitions of why it is correct to be implemented in this kind of way of course it also has uh relevance to compiler implementations in the real world for example gcc used to get it wrong and now they don't it's also as i said a pass through reasoning about arm because in terms of concurrency arm has a really similar concurrency model to power so you can reason about arm implementations as well so the plan for the rest of the talk then is i'll introduce to you a few examples of relaxed memory behavior showing the kinds of things that we have to deal with when doing this kind of proof i'll then for most of the talk talk about the power model that we de devised taking into account all the various kinds of things that happen on power and arm architectures i'll talk about synchronizing operations like compare and swap and then wrap up by talking about this proof of c11 okay so relaxed memory behavior then so perhaps many of you have seen this before a quick show of hands how many have the message passing okay so half 
So here's our simple shared memory concurrent program. There's two threads, thread 0 and thread 1, operating on two uh, shared memory locations, D for data and F for flag. And what this program, which I call message passing, you might also have seen of it, heard of it as producer consumer does, is a really rather simple uh, and widely used phenomenon when you are doing shared memory concurrency. What's going on is the writer thread or the producer is doing writing something to the data structure, D, and then setting a flag saying it's done. The reader or the consumer thread waits to until it sees that flag and then accesses the data structure. So the question here is, is the reader ever allowed to see an old value of data? And if you're thinking of this in interleaving kinds of terms, then the answer is clearly no. You can never see an old value out here because we are waiting for the flag. So what happens if you take that program as written and just feed it to your compiler, C compiler, say? So what happens as of C11, so as of late 2011, is that C says, well, that program has undefined semantics. It has no semantics at all. And why not? Because, of course, there's races on both the data and the flag variables here. So what if you really wanted to program at the low level? You wanted to do this kind of stuff. Then what C11 lets you do is to mark variables on which races are OK. It does this by calling them atomic variables and marking the loads and stores. So here I'm using C++ syntax. There's equivalent C syntax also introduced. And these are marked as an atomic store to data and flag and an atomic load from flag and data. You're also allowed to give various parameters. So, so here's one of them, which is, uh, for those of you in the know, the relaxed memory order parameter. So anyway, what happens with that? And what happens with that is, first of all, C11 says that program has defined semantics. Furthermore, it is possible for that program to read an old value of data right there. So why did C11 allow that kind of thing? It did that to allow for various hardware and indeed compiler optimizations. So on modern hardware, like for example, Power or ARM, it would look at those two stores and see well, those are two, two different locations, right? There's no reason for me to keep them in order. Let's just take them in order to other threads out of order. And then, of course, you can see them out of order out here. A different kind of thing that ARM does is it allows speculative loads. That is, it says, well, that load is to a different location there. Let's speculate it. Let's do it early, even before that loop finishes. And again, of course, you can see an old value. I'll point out that on x86, like machines, TSO, you don't get this by itself. But of course, your compiler can do stores and loads out of order as well if it's an optimizing compiler. And in fact, many of them do. So what if you really wanted to program message passing or producer consumer in C11? Then you'd have to give different parameters to these atomic stores and loads. What you'd have to do is to call that store a release kind of store, and that load an acquire kind of load. If you do both of those things, then C11 says that because that acquire load reads from a release store, there's enough synchronization in the program, and therefore, in C, that load is never allowed to read an old value. Okay. So what is an implementation supposed to do? It must forbid any compiler optimizations, such as reordering these stores or loads that it might have done otherwise. Furthermore, when it's uh, implementing this on hardware, it must take steps, inserting barrier instructions of various kinds to make sure that this never occurs on a real hardware. Right. So the recommended way to implement message passing by translating that program that I had in C into assembly is some, looks like something like this. So what's going on here is that there's a barrier which is, in power terms, a lightweight sink. And what it does, briefly, is to take stores before it and after it and keep them in order as they go across to other threads. So it forbids that means of reordering the stores. Out here, meanwhile, 
that is a different kind of perio, an isync, which you are supposed to insert. And what that isync does is taking into account the loop before, it makes sure that the succeeding loads can no longer be speculated up above. Okay? So if you do both of those things, then you will not see this on ARM or on power. And we have tested this out. You, in fact, never do. OK. Questions? So do you know if ISIC actually slows down branch speculation? Is it a? Uh, it does a slow down branch speculation. So what, it, uh, what its job in life is to do is to basically stop branch speculation, or the branch prediction mechanism that modern hardware does have. SC. Ah, SC is sequentially consistent, this kind of uh, old style interleaving model that we used to think of. What's SEQ CST? Ah, so SEQ CST is one more of these kinds of memory orders that you are allowed to have in C. And what that says briefly is that if you annotate all your stores and loads as SEQ CST, then you will get back sequentially consistent behavior. Uh, how did the icing get outside of the loop? Ah, I did a bit of optimization there, but a very tiny bit. You're right, in fact. It uh, should have been inside the loop. I just hoisted it out. And this is a rather easy analysis to do. Okay. okay. So that's message passing or producer consumer. What? So, so does ARM also have a similar, something similar to icing? Yes, it does. It's called uh, instruction synchronization barrier or ISB. Alpha was relevant, would it have presented any further challenges? Uh, you would have to look at the alpha barriers, but yes, alpha has similar barriers that would do similar kinds of things. Stop read speculation, stop write reordering, and so on. And yeah, of course, if you are doing this on different hardware, you would have to look at the carefully at the memory model there. So for example, Itanium would have something different again. Right, so in general, there are lots of questions that you might ask for programs that are not just message passing. So there are very particular kinds of questions that people ask. Is it safe to remove that barrier there? There's more general kinds of questions, such as the one I'm talking about. Can we even implement this concurrency model that I've come up with on realistic hardware? There's more semantic -y kind of questions. Is it possible for, the, for us to guarantee to the programmer that you'll always get sequentially consistent behavior if I say, lock all my accesses, or barrier all my accesses, or something like that. And then there's kinds of compilers kind of questions. Is it legal to do these kinds of optimizations? So where would you turn to if you wanted to answer these questions? One of the places you might turn to is to look at the manuals. All of these guys, the ARM, the Power, x86, C++, they come with manuals which are really big, chunky beasts. And they are, well, scary just because they are chunky, but they are even more scary when you open the pages. They are written in this kind of standard ease, which is quite vague and imprecise. In fact, as we found out in previous work, sometimes they are just plain wrong. They are lying out, flat out lying to you. So it is no surprise then that even guys who write these, they say things like, this is horribly incomprehensible. Nobody can ever, ever pass or reason these, with these things. What else might you think of doing? One other kind of thing that you might think of doing is to test out the implementations. Of course, they are just sitting there, right? That laptop of mine, that has a multi-core x86. The phones that many of you are carrying around, or the iPads, they have multi-core arms. So we can run these programs, see what they are doing. So we did this. We take small tests, and then we run them lots and lots and lots of times many different iterations with randomization trying to explore what happens. And we found various kinds of corner cases, various rather rare behavior. In fact, sometimes we found corner cases that were bugs, real honest to God bugs in deployed hardware. So testing is good. But of course, you have to interpret the results of the tests as well. And here you have to talk with the guys who are designing these beasts, as well as guys who are using these. So people 
who are designing from the hardware side and people who are programming about them. And they know typically quite a bit about their own designs or algorithms or what have you. But here we are trying to think of the general case. So we have to get to focus on what is the programmer observable behavior. So realistically, of course, you have to do this over and over again in an iterative process. You read the manuals, you formalize what you think they are saying, you test it out, you see the results, and you discuss the con consequences. And then you go back, you have to tweak the model, do this iterative process again. In this process, we found that we were not just discovering what the programmer model is, but in fact, inventing it. Nobody really knew what was going on. I'll point out also that in doing this kind of work, it's critical to have machine assistance. So, and we used all kinds of things. We used theorem provers, we used model checkers, we used SAT solvers to help us automate this process, keep track of what our assumptions were and what that implied. Based on this kind of work, what we did was devise a precise model of the power and the arm. And it looks something like this. There's a model of the thread system. And this uh, models the various kinds of behavior that realistic uh, cores do, realistic cores or threads do, abstracting away and talking, dealing with things that depend only on, for example, core level speculation. Next, there is an interconnection between all these threads, which we call the storage subsystem. And this abstracts away from all the different kinds of interconnects, the cache protocols, and what have you that joins up all these threads. Formally speaking, they are just abstract machines or labeled transition systems, which are a very operational way of thinking. They chug along and synchronize with each other on different messages. And they are rather abstract abstracting away from all the microarchitecture details. So to give you just one example of what I'm talking about, here's a hand wavy explanation of microarchitecture. On modern hardware, there is various kinds of, uh, various levels of buffering that is going on. And it's the case on architectures like the ARM that you can have levels of this buffering shared by different threads. So these two threads are, in some senses, close neighbors, and they are far away from these guys. And this shows up in real examples. You can write programs which depict that a write done by that thread is seen by that one, which is close by, but not seen yet by other ones which are far away. And perhaps there's even more levels of hierarchy. So there's levels of closeness that you might have. So that's a fine microarchitectural kind of explanation. But you really don't want to write programs which depend on two threads being close together and two other threads being far away. What we did was something much more abstract. We equipped each thread in our system with its own private memory and then having a peer-to-peer -peer linkages between all of them. In doing this, we have abstracted away totally from the particular topology that we have at the moment. Right. So to give you a sense of uh, what else we need. Here's another example. And this is quite similar to the message passing example that we had. This is, this is uh, meant to show you the kinds of things that happen when you program on more than two threads. So over here, what I've done is I've taken message passing and I've split up the writing thread. So the guy who writes data is split off into its own thread. And this middle intermediate thread, what it does is wait for that data and then set the flag. On the reading thread, meanwhile, that's just that uh, load of flag and that load of data, but in a particular funny way. A particular funny way is that dynamically, it's always going to read from data because that XOR is always going to return zero. But syntactically, it looks like that value of that data, uh, value of the address we are going to read from depends on that load. What all that rigmarole does is it, uh, it gums up the speculation of loads. And this is something you can do and people take advantage of doing on uh, machines like the ARM. So here we can uh, omit the barrier, the icing that we had before because of that dependency. So anyway, the. Where did it get the deep run? 
Sorry. Uh, so D though is reading from global variable? So D and F are still global variables. Like and so where do you want to do D plus zero so that you... So we are going to read from lower. Uh, dependency on the lower on F. Exactly. So, so and do the architects actually, do they, do they allow, do they agree with this? They do agree. Because they, yes, this does prevent some op future optimization. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. So they are tying one hand behind their backs in doing this. But they do guarantee this, and uh, they guarantee this because programmers uh, want to make reads cheap. So recall in the previous example, we had that iSync, which is a bit more expensive than doing this kind of thing. So this is a kind of programming use case. So anyway, the question we ask is again the same. Can we ever read an old value of data? And to prevent that, you really need a property of the barrier there, which is called cumulativity. Not only does that barrier there keep same thread stores and loads, uh, sorry, same thread stores before it in order with stores after it, but keeps any store that it might have read before the barrier in order with respect to stores after that barrier. So this is a kind of property that you really need when you are going from two to three and more threads. Okay. It's called cumulativity. So just to give you a flavor of the kind of model that we have, uh, here's a description of one rule. You don't have to read this very carefully. I just brought this up to show you that we are talking in terms of quite abstract concepts, just in terms of concepts that I have been talking about here. So a write can propagate to another thread under some conditions, and the conditions are stated fairly abstractly as well. There's some kind of sanity check that it has not yet been propagated. There's the cumulativity condition that all barriers before have already been propagated, and there's some other conditions to make coherence sane. It's not too scary to look at. And if you look at the formal mathematical definition, it's not too scary either. It's just basically a direct transliteration of the explanation and prose that I had before. This is propagating a write w to a thread tid prime. And again, there's some sanity conditions. It has not already been propagated. There's the coherence condition there, uh, sorry, the cumulativity condition there of barriers before being after, and the coherence condition. It's not too big. So to talk about another feature of the example of the machines, and this time about the core level speculations, I'll introduce this example which might look a bit scary, but I'll walk you through it slowly. Think of it as just message passing. In fact, on the writer thread, it's just the same exact thing. There's a write to D, the barrier, and the write to F. Over here on the reading thread, we have the write to flag there, and uh, sorry, the load to flag there, and, a, and the load from a location which is going to turn out to be D dynamically always there. So it's just message passing. In between, however, we are doing some funny stuff. So the funny stuff we are doing is, we are looking at that flag and, well, fine. We are ensuring that we always read one and otherwise going off somewhere. But if we do, we are writing something out to some temporary location, reading it back, and then doing a, something that seems to depend on the value you loaded just there. Okay. So what does all that complicated rigmarole give you? So here's a chain of reasoning. That load seems to depend on that load up there. And therefore, it cannot be speculated before that load. Okay? Now that load, of course, is going to take its value from that store. And therefore, it cannot be done any earlier than that store. If you read the manuals, meanwhile, They'll promise to you stores in power and on ARM are not speculated past branches. So you'd think that would mean that that store there, it's not going to be speculated before you get back a value, before the branch gets resolved, and thereby before that you do that read. Okay? Now that read, if it's ever to read one, has to take its value from that right there. And because of that barrier, by that time, that store must have come across to this thread as well. So you'd think that 
if you depended on all of those chains of reasoning that I quickly sketched out, you'd never be able to read an old value of data. And you can run this program out, we did, and we discovered that in fact, in some cases, you do. So what's going on here? Where in that chain of reasoning that I had was the flaw that allowed this to happen? The flaw was that the manuals are correct in saying that that store is not going to be speculated as far as other threads are concerned. This is the part they missed out. As far as the same thread is concerned, it can perfectly well forward it. So what's going on in the real hardware is that the branch prediction mechanism is saying, ah, I'm not going to take that branch. So we are eventually going to get to that store. And therefore, that load will eventually get its value from that store. Clear the dependency, do that load, all good. Sometime later, along, along comes both of those stores. You read that, you see that, in fact, you did read one, and therefore your speculation was justified things are good. This turned out to be quite a surprise to both the designers and the programmers in that now speculation is in fact visible to the programmer. Right. So we had to in fact explicitly model this kind of speculation in our model. And uh, Are you willing to fix the hardware? Oh no, 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 no. 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 Did you ask them? Because you said it did confuse the designers as well. And they, didn't, they didn't expect this to be happening. Yes. Okay. But once they saw it, they said, yeah, well, deal with it, basically. It doesn't look like a big deal to me. I mean, I wouldn't... So, so this is the kind of argument that they make. Yeah. This, is, this is not... A, it doesn't look so different to me from store buffers all along. Where the source sure, of sure. Uh, sure, so in the kind of uh, programming kind of uh, worldview, Maybe you really shouldn't have been depending on all that complicated chain that I talked about. You should have had barriers. And this is, this is the kind of arguments that hardware designers do, and in fact, why they say that we are not willing to fix the hardware or the model. So I'm just pointing out that, contrary to your expectations, you really have to think about speculation if you are going to explore all the possible behaviors of all kinds of programs. Right? So, so anyway. So our model has to deal with speculation, and it does that in just the kind of way you'd think of doing if you were, in fact, modeling speculation. You have instructions which are in flight, and later they are going to be committed. They're going to be in flight even past program order branches. So those arrows are program orders. I have a question about um, having to deal with speculation. So mm -hmm. in some sense, there's two levels of having to deal with speculation. One level is having to deal with the fact that events could, could be temporally or somehow ordered before they're you know, confirmed. Right. Uh, which is, I think we have been used to that for a long time now. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is you have to deal with uh, speculations that, with misspeculations. So right. misspeculations are somehow observable. Mm -hmm. the system. That one seems much worse. So, so which one are you talking about here when you say you have to consider? So I'm talking about both of those. Yes. So, so the example that I had before uh, was where the, your speculation was justified. But there's also examples where your speculation was unjustified. And you have something about the misspeculated execution that influences the actual final execution? Um, so it uh, influences the values that you read on the same thread, yes. Can you give any, do you have an example? Uh, not in these slides. So, so let me add, so in the sense, uh -huh. if, if the, oh, oh, so what Sebastian was saying is that if the hardware does some branch misspeculation that eventually turns out to be wrong, right. like the instruction it executed in the wrong branch could somehow influence uh, uh, the, the non-speculated correct execution. Yes, that, that was your question. That right? was the question. Um, you can see it in various kinds of ways. So I'll get to talking about CASES, for example. So it could make your CASES fail where they were not supposed to. Oh. Right. Um, CASES can fail even for even if you don't have branch speculation, right? That's a spec in power. Uh, right. right. Even LLSC can just right. fail even if you're the only thread that's ever well, mostly it does not, yeah, sure. At least the spec says, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so anyway, we have to deal with speculation in the model. So, in terms of the size of the model, then we have an explanation about three pages of prose, explanation at the level I showed you. So, the and in math, it's about 2500 lines. 2500 lines of a new language that we devised, we call it LEM. And what LEM does is basically it's a front end language. You can extract proof assistant definitions from it. So, you can extract Hall 4 and very soon now COC code out of it. You can also extract executable code that is OCaml. So, I wrote a harness about above this automatically extracted code and what that let me have was a tool that could explore the model, exhaustively checking it or interactively checking it. It turns out you can compile OCaml bytecode to JavaScript and thereby you can run it on your browser. I am told you can run it on your phone, but I have not personally tested this out. So, here I am running that program. This is running a model just in JavaScript in, a, in, the, uh, in the browser. We call this tool ppcmm. And what you can do here is write assembly code by yourself if you want. We also have a library of tests. So, I will take for example, a plain old message passing example. So, here is real assembly code that just does message passing. I have taken off all the barriers. So, there is just the plain stores and loads here. So, that is store is power assembly speak for stores. There is a store to load two locations on this thread and load from the other locations on that thread. And you can ask the question whether it is possible for you to read one first and zero next. Right? So, you can hit the non-interactive mode and what will that, that what that will do is exhaustively check our model and see whether it is possible. I do not recommend doing this in JavaScript because it is slow, but you can do it in the command line version of the tool that we have. But you can also do interactive checking. And if you do interactive checking, you can step through what the model says. So, here is the state of the system. There is a state for the storage subsystem and state for each of the threads. As you can see at this point of time, nothing much has happened. There is just the initialization rights that have been seen. And all these instructions here are waiting around. Okay. All the uh, transitions that our model now enables are clickable now. So, for example, I can commit that instruction in there. And once I do that, all the preconditions for committing that store is possible. So, I can now commit that store, thereby making the right of 1 to y visible. I will point out also that I did this well before I did commits of that store there. right? So, I really did out of order commits. I can for example, read again out of order on that thread, maybe even commit that, why not? And then perhaps propagate this thread there, uh, this right there to that thread. Now, you will see that I can only read 1, whereas before I used to be able to read 0. We can undo it, go down various other steps you get the idea. We have a variety of different tests as I said a library including the speculation example that I had various others. You can go in and for example, write in a barrier and see what happens. So, it is really fun to play with and it lets you uh, explore our model the consequences thereof. So, how do we go about validating the model that we had? Well, first of all, we can by the process I just said extract executable code and have this exhaustive checker. So, we can take tiny litmus tests and then see all the different kinds of behavior that is allowed by the model. We can also take the very same tests and run them on real hardware. This we did on various different generations of power and we built up histograms of what behavior was seen and not seen on different hardware. So, here is a tiny excerpt of results and I will show you how to read those results. First of all, concentrate on the behaviors that the model says is forbidden. In other words, the model guarantees that this will never be seen. It is important for the model to be sound that you never do actually see that on real hardware. So, we tested this 
quite a number of times. That, so that's about 10 to the 11 times. This is, of course, empirical testing. So maybe it would have changed on the 10 to the 12th run. But we did a reasonable amount of effort. Next, there are tests where the model says some behavior is allowed. Most of the times, what you see is that it really does occur on real hardware, sometimes really often, sometimes not quite so often. Sometimes, for some varieties of tests, you see them on some generations of the hardware and not on the others. This points out a key fact that your specifications that you're building up, these models, they have to be loose models because they have to cover all the different variants of the architecture that you might have. In fact, future implementations as well. And this brings me to the last kind of models, uh, last kind of tests, where in fact, a model says they are allowed, but you have never seen them on real hardware. We took all of these kinds of tests and discussed them quite carefully with the designers. And in all of these cases, what they say is, yes, particular features of the microarchitecture that they have so far implemented ensures that it is not seen on current hardware. But they want to leave open the possibility that some future generations of the hardware might do these kinds of things. Okay. So I'll briefly move on now to talking about synchronizing operations because they are fun and they are used by the several real world programmers. So what do I mean? Sorry. Yeah, I have a question about this model. Uh -huh. So, is the model understandable to, to smart programmers? So, uh, I would like that to, is an evaluation. I would like to think so. So, I, yeah. So, it's in basically at the scale that I showed you an excerpt of writes are propagating to threads, barriers are propagating to threads. And to help them understand, we also have this tool that will let them explore consequences of programs that they have. So do you envision that we could write like a verification tools? Like let's say if I wrote a piece of code and I believe that this code had some specification, like you know, it's implementing a link as well. So, so is there, how, I mean, what's the effort required to prove intuitively, like for a programmer to convince mm -hmm. himself that right. so, uh, is right. Yeah, so that's a good question. We have, uh, we have in fact looked at various rather simple algorithms, basically linked lists, and tried to reason informally in to on top of this model, and then tested out our informal reasoning by running it through this kind of tests that we have. So this is kind of things we have been doing. We also want to package this up, and this is sort of future work, and package this up into reasoning principles, which let you reason at a higher level. So, so this model is um, operational in the sense, do you, do you have an understanding on what the matching axiomatic model is or do you know just know some axioms that you um, know are current? We haven't invested much, uh, much effort into that kind of thing because, well, any axiomatic thing that would precisely capture the operational model would be equivalent, would have more or less much of the operational understanding baked in. But on a different kind of front, the C++ model, it is an axiomatic model. Yes. And it can be soundly implemented. That's a proof that we did. Right. So we can have ap axiomatic approximations. If you're looking for precise axiomatic, uh, yes. uh, precise axiomatic. So yes, yeah. so I guess the C++ model is a reasonable axiomatic approximation. Okay, uh, so briefly moving on to talk about synchronization operations. Well, what do I mean by that? Things that you might have looked on as compares and swaps, atomic addition, atomic subtraction, that kind of thing. So if you are programming on a risk-like architecture, what do you typically get are pairs of instructions, sometimes called load reserve and store conditional, or load linked store conditional. And what these are, are they let you implement all of these different kinds of synchronization operations. So here's a uh, implementation of the atomic addition primitive. So out here, it's a, there's a load reserve, which on power is called a LOX or a load linked. And out here is a store conditional, which is called a strux. So informally, what's going on? What's going on is that 
the lox is a load and you can do various other stuff for example in atomic addition maybe you want to add stuff and then you do a store conditional among other things the store condition is a store but it's a particular kind of store it's a store that can succeed and thereby do the store but it can fail and thereby not do the store the machine tells you whether it succeeded or not in a flag and the typical way to use this is to loop back and try again if you failed so what's supposed to happen if that sequence gives you an atomic addition what does that mean what's supposed to happen informally is that the machine says the stocks can succeed only if no other thread wrote to that location in question d since the last lox okay so if you are thinking in a kind of relaxed memory behavior at this point you should be jumping at my throats what is this since you speak of what does that mean maybe since in machine time turns out that's a wrong answer that's neither necessary nor sufficient and to understand what's going on you have to think of really what is the micro, micro architecture doing so informally speaking the micro architecture what it's doing is if that thread in question did not lose ownership of the cache line between the locks and the stocks then it knows that it uh, no other thread could have written in in between and therefore the load and the store were atomic so that's a fine micro architectural exam uh, explanation but of course as a programmer do you want to reason about do i own the cache have i lost ownership of the cache you want to think in a more abstract level and to think in a more abstract level you have to think about what is it that that cache protocol is buying you what that cache protocol is buying you in terms of transferring ownership from one thread to the other is building up a cho chain of ownership for the location in play it's building up in other words an order relating stores to that location we call this coherence that you can agree on on every different thread once you have that abstract notion in your hands now it's easier to state what atomic means what it means is that a stocks is allowed to succeed only if it can become coherence right next to the right it read from so those two are atomic furthermore of course this coherence it's an abstract order so it builds up over time so it must be the case that you are never allowed to violate that atomic of those two rights staying together ever again so that's a key concept we need and now we can give it a name we call this right reaching coherence point and we do this in our model by saying that a store dynamically reaches coherence point operationally when this abstract order of coherence that we have built up it becomes linear below this right and furthermore it's never going to be become different again Level at which your model is written. This is you, exactly. you have these relations that you add to, yes, exactly. and then you never remove any edges, I guess. Or so all your rules uh, have preconditions eh, that they are never doing bad edges. Yeah, exactly. So okay. Uh, so of course you also have to deal with what the interactions are with the rest of the system. In other words, what are the interactions with the stores normal kind of stores and loads and barriers that you had before and it's really easy to get this wrong uh, there was a rather recent kernel bug where they got confused about what the ordering properties were with respect to normal loads and stores but once you have this kind of formal model then you can prove stuff about it one kind of simple uh, result that you can get is that if you replaced all your accesses in other words all your stores and loads by atomic kinds of accesses then you regain sequentially consistent behavior so this is an alternative to locking all your stores and loads or maybe putting barriers between every pairs of stores and loads right to wrap up then i'll talk about the proof of uh, correctness of implementation for c11 i don't have time here to talk about the whole of the c11 model it's rather complex i just hand wave it at a rather high level so here's the program that we saw before and we have seen multiple times in this talk the release acquire version of message passing so what c11 is 
is what's called an axiomatic model. What that means is it reasons not about that program making steps, but after that program has executed and created all its stores and loads, whether that execution was allowed or not. So it takes that program and it converts all of those stores and loads that you get into events. And then it defines various relations on those stores and loads events. And furthermore, various uh, axioms about those relations. So it has various kinds of relations. There's a relation which, which is called sequence before, which is sort of like program order. And there's various other kinds of relations. The key one here is something called happens before, which is defined in a very particular way in C11. And right here in this example, what it does is, because that was a release and an acquire, there is happens before, there, there, and there. There's now consistency conditions on this execution. And for example, a kind of consistency condition that is there is that that read is allowed to read from that store, but it's not because of that happens before chain allowed to read from something further back, that initialization rate. Also, I'll point out that the semantics are only defined for race-free programs. And races here are defined very particularly in terms of this happens before relation. So there they are. There's a bunch of axioms, fairly complex axioms. But in fact, there is some intuition behind those axioms. And this we discover by doing this kind of proof. So the base case of that happens before relation that I had was just that synchronization between a release kind of store and an acquire kind of load. And we see this clearly reflect itself in things that you get on the hardware, properties of the barriers that we had. Next, this kind of release acquire synchronization, it has to be transitive. That is, if you do release acquire here, and then on another location, perhaps you do release acquire to another thread, all of these guys should chain up together. And this corresponds in a fairly direct way, again, to properties of the hardware, the cumulative property that we talked about. There's various other kinds of things. There's particular features of C11 that were carefully designed to take into account dependencies. And this comes up in the power when you are doing this kind of dependent reasoning that I was doing. The special rules for compare and swap, and these correspond in a fairly direct way to reasoning about when is it possible for writes or store conditionals to reach their coherence point. Okay. So then, how do we prove this theorem? The broad view is, recall that we are talking about all possible C programs. When in fact, C11 does not give any semantics at all to race C programs. So we need only consider data race free programs. Because other programs they are allowed to do whatever it is that they want. So for any program then, we look at any compiler. But not just any compiler, any sane compiler, like I said. What does that mean? What that means is that it preserves memory accesses. It does not optimize them away or reorder them. Okay. Furthermore, it uses the mapping table that we had. So if we take any such compiler at all, then we, take, then we look at the target of that compiler. We have a model for the power, and therefore, we can find all the behavior that that power program has. This model, recall, is an operational kind of model. So the behavior you have is the set of traces that the model is allowed to have. You look at each of those trace candidate traces, and you try to build up executions as allowed by C11. You do this by building up the key relations that you need, that happens before and so on, out of the trace. In each case, you'll find that the axioms that C11 depend on, they depend on features of the machine. So you have to look closely at what the machine is doing. There's also a subtlety here in that, of course, on the machine level, there's no concept of a race. Programs just do something. So if it looked like, looks like there is, in fact, a racy kind of execution in terms of C11, you have to actually construct that race in C11 and thereby get a contradiction with that data race free precondition. So this can be done. And we did this. It's a proof. And 
what did we learn in doing this proof? We learned various kinds of things. We learned, for example, that release acquire reasoning is well used by a lot of programmers, but also corresponds directly to what hardware does. So it in fact transfers directly between software and hardware levels. And if you can think of your programs just in terms of release acquire, maybe it's a good thing too. We also learn facts about the hardware. We learn facts that if a certain hardware optimization were to be done, and by the way, this optimization is seemingly quite natural to do, then in fact, C11 would be unimplementable. Unimplementable that is without putting in barriers absolutely everywhere, and thereby defeating the point of having different kinds of stores and loads. Fortunately, current hardware does not do this. And now we have a strong argument to put forth to designers about why they should never do it. Okay. We also. Your definition of unimplementable is that if you need fences for regular stores and loads, is that your definition of unimplementable? Effect. Unimplementable efficient, yes. Um, yeah, and we also learned various ways, as I said, of regaining sequential consistent behavior. So, can we go to the previous part? Yeah. So, so, here you start. You, I can think of this as the last phase of the compiler, right? So, in the sense, the compiler takes a source level program mm -hmm. and then compiles it to, let's say, machine independent IR. And then it's going to have a back end phase that's going to take this IR and then translate it to public. Um, Sure. And so I could think of the program. Um, so, 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 okay. The, the, the reason I asked is, can you actually um, ha have two phases of the compiler where you allow all DR of zero optimizations right. in the top phase sure. to get to the IR, and yeah. then yeah. you use this translation to yeah, power? Absolutely. absolutely. Then with this theorem hold, then can you prove that? Yes. Uh, yes. Sure. Sure. Okay. So you can do any kind of. Uh, optimizations which stay within DRF up there. I think you, what the problem is, if you if you force yourself to stay within DRF, you're not allowed to do some things that otherwise you would be able to do if you drop down earlier. For example, in in the power model, for example, you can there's no problem with data races in the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you want to introduce a data race in the power program because it makes your program run faster, you, you're okay with doing that. No, 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 I, I, what, I, no, no. Uh, that is not what I'm asking. Yeah. I agree with you, right? But I'm asking that real compilers actually, when I, I'm not sure if they are sane, but they are definitely optimizing. optimizing. Absolutely. Right? They do remove memory operations. Oh, yeah, sure. And yes. They do reorder memory sure. operations. Yeah. So as long as they stay within this. I suppose the other, another way of asking the question is, you're trying to design an intermediate representation that has the C11 model. Exactly. And I think that's a perfectly. If I cast all transformations at the, the front end of the, I mean, the, 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 the top half of the compiler is doing as source to source translation, right? right. You know, from C plus to C plus plus. Yes, so yeah. then our results yeah. still apply. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the question our is, still is, that, is that reasonable? Are you reasonable and flexible if you have to stay with him? Um, Probably if you have. A no, no, my question practice. was more as in can I take this theorem and then prove that GCC is correct? Um, but GCC does not stay within C C plus plus DRF. So uh, version of GCC that is DRF compliant. That's right. Yeah. So then you our theorems would apply. And in fact they are trying to build up to that kind of right. so version as well. Stronger than what the first line would say, right? So in the sense you know, you could come up with an optimizing compiler with restrictions on the compiler for which this theorem holds up. Oh, absolutely. And we do want to do that kind of thing. But at the first instance, we are just going from source to target. So you're allowed to do any, as Sebastian is saying, uh, optimizations that stay within that fragment. A sort of future work is, what if you take uh, optimizations that go outside that fragment, but still, in some way, preserve source level properties. For example, one thing the compiler is definitely going to do is if you do the ZOR trick, like mm -hmm. if you read a register, uh -huh. ZOR it with itself, and add it to something, it's going to replace that with zero. It's sure. definitely going to remove sure. that. Sure. You have to make sure that 
Ah, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought, brought that up. So it's perfectly safe to do that for uh, non-atomic or what you used to think of as normal stores and loads. But it's not safe in C11 to do that for uh, atomics or volatiles, say. So, so this for is for regular stores and loads, your theorem should be strong enough to show that this is okay. Right? The compiler can do we that. have to do a bit of work, not very hard work, I don't think, but sure. Okay. Well, do you think come from the DRF property? Um, yes, essentially. You are doing sort of source level optimizations that still stay within DRF. Because of course you are optimizing away non-atomic stores and loads. If there was no race to begin with, you are not introducing new races. Right. Okay. In some sense, that is the research question. You know, sure. Can you get uh, the most important optimizations done while staying in the DRF? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so here we are. Here we have been reasoning about mainstream concurrent programs at the very lowest level, doing this on real hardware like the power and arm and trying to show how high level language primitives can be compiled. So we have a theorem which is the correct compilation result and this clearly has, as I said, relevance to real world compilers and it also builds confidence in these models. What about the future? Well, one thing about this proof is that it really boils down what is it that we are depending on from the hardware. And this lets us design new kinds of hardware that maybe relaxes some of these also, of course, this is a path to reasoning about low level programs, but re building up our reasoning principles from assembly level up to high level language. Maybe C and C++ is not to your understanding a high enough level language, but sure beats reasoning about in terms of assembly. Thank you for your attention and there's more details there in particular. That's the URL for the tool, which I really encourage you to play with. Thank you. So I don't know if you have sort of questions. questions after the fact. So it looks like I have two options now. Say I want to write a, a low level, log free, opti highly optimized piece of code. Right. Should I try to use the C++ memory model to do that, or should I use your model? Um, so my personal feeling is that you should use a C11 model because in fact then you can port it to various different kinds of hardware. So my uh, the proof that I just did was to let you do that reasoning at C11 while still getting all the properties that power gives you. Of course if you care just about power or for example if you care just about ARM then you can use directly my models to reason about it at that level as well. Thank you. Thanks.